you want me to turn down the light? There is. This is a mic right okay. here. Cool. Okay. It, um, but I also think the acoustics are pretty good in this room. Um, and I'll shut that door before I sit down. So, Hello. Thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. I'm Emily Lanto. I'm the director and curator of the Art Museum here at NMU. And I'm so pleased to welcome Jessica Campbell uh, here from Toronto uh, on the occasion of her opening at Gracie Gallery. So it's a fun collaboration uh, with the gallery downtown. And after the talk tonight, there'll be a reception that starts at 7 and goes until 9. Um, this talk and all of our talks and programs are supported by annual donors. Uh, and so that allows us to ensure that everything that we do is free. Um, talks and also admission to the museum is free because of people who give to the museum annually. And so thank you very much. Um, also, I'd like to uh, ask you to join us tonight in acknowledging that we stand upon the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabe. In doing so, we seek to heal trauma uh, inflicted by an ongoing history of colonization and correct intergenerational injustice. By acknowledging this, we respect these vibrant living and present cultures. This is how we choose to move forward with humility, honor, and gratitude, and a shared love for this beautiful place and the stories within it. Jessica Campbell is an interdisciplinary artist working in comics, fibers, painting, drawing, and performance, drawing on a wide range of influences, including science fiction, art world, politics, uh, and her uh, uh, evangelical upbringing. Jessica Campbell explores ways uh, to reflect on uh, heterogeneity through a combination of disparate media, subjects, and tone, whether through cartoony depictions, and you may have seen uh, Jessica Campbell's work out in the lobby last week, uh, uh, or the use of unorthodox material. Her work often uh, uses hum humor as a device for managing trauma. Uh, and Jessica is an accomplished artist. I remember first seeing your work at the MCA in Chicago with my partner and I, and we were just like immediately intrigued. Uh, and then seeking it out again at Western Exhibitions, which is another gallery in Chicago. And I particularly remember uh, Abraham Lincoln with a fidget spinner nose. Yes. And so um, we followed uh, Jessica Campbell's work uh, uh, for, for many years, uh, not only uh, your work in galleries and museums in both group and solo shows, but also in comics and in graphic novels. Um, I remember seeing Hot or Not and, and several other books uh, in the past several years. Um, this summer, uh, Jessica had work published by MoMA. Uh, her work has been in The New Yorker, Hyper Allergic, among other publications. And she also had a show at John Michael Kohler this summer, and just opened a show at the Fabric Workshop. Wait, is that right? Am I like, am I, am I blanking? Yeah, at the Fabric Workshop in Philadelphia, which is like another really amazing space. So please help me in welcoming Jessica Campbell. Um, thank you, Emily. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Thank you, Joe, for inviting me to show your space, and David Schmidt, who helped coordinate all of this and who is a former colleague from Chicago. Um, I'm just going to make sure I have my clock on here so I don't talk for hours and hours. Okay, here we go. Um, so like Emily mentioned, I'm an interdisciplinary artist who works largely across like fibers, uh, kind of like this some of the stuff that you can see here in this slide and comics. And so what I thought I would do to start is just do a short reading of the comic that was published by MoMA this summer, which is kind of the, the most recent comic that I've had published. Um, and then I'll move into talking more about the studio work. Okay. Um, uh, so there's some text that you can read on the screen and then there's, there's additional text that I'll read out loud here. So. Uh, my friend Lee McClure had a tattoo that read, still alive. The joke is that one day a mortician will see it and will laugh at me for being dead. The tattoo always reminded me of the On Kawara project, I Am Still Alive, which entailed Kawara sending telegrams containing the sentence to friends, like this one you can see here. Um, of this project, Kawara said, and just a side note for 
potential cartoonists in the room, this is the correct amount of text to put in a word balloon. People really like <laughs> reading this amount of text. Okay, Kawara said of this project, in a certain sense, the phrase, I am still alive, can never be sent as it cannot be received by the addressee instantaneously. It is only valid at the very instant that it is being written, and in the very next second, it is no longer a certainty. If the addressee receives the telegram a few hours or days later and reads it, he merely knows that the sender was alive at the very instant the telegram was sent. But when he is reading the telegram, he is totally uncertain if the content of the text is still relevant or if it is still valid. The difference, the small displacement between the sending and receiving is that particular unseizable glimpse of the presence of the artist. Likewise, it is a sentence of self-reassurance. I am still alive. The activity of telling oneself and the world, I am still alive. Unlike with the Kawara, with Kawara's project, in a tattoo, the reader is 100% certain of whether the content of the text is still relevant. I don't think so, buddy. Lee and I grew up on Vancouver Island, uh, which is off the west coast of Canada, kind of near Seattle, which is geographically and somewhat culturally isolated. Art and humor are our ways of connecting with the greater world and processing our own experiences. I can't believe you haven't seen Stroshek. We're going to rent it. Sounds great. Speaking of Germans, have you ever heard of this painter, Neo Rausch? You'll love him. Uh, and in addition to being a diligent reader and viewer, Lee made art that uncannily distilled the absurdity of the world. He was particularly interested in lampooning masculinity. Of his own work, he wrote, my bearded men cannot know what they wish to know and so are left wall-eyed at the ever-expanding nature of their questions. They are naked and foolish in the face of eternity. His work looked like this. When Lee got the Still Alive tattoo, I felt a pang of grief because we'd recently broken up after a long-term relationship, and I couldn't stomach the thought of his body changing from the one I'd known. I felt like every tattoo was a demarcation of the growing chasm between us, a physical demarcation of our drift apart. In retrospect, this feels like a perfectly stupid interpretation. Tattoos are cool, and Lee's looked good. Plus, we didn't drift apart, at least not for long. We were bonded to each other. December 4th, 2022. Uh, oh my God, I'm also coming back to Victoria, December 23 to 31. I pray to see you. Also, I pray to see you. Oh, good. I hope we get to hang out. Uh, and then there's some blacked out texts. We were shit talking our parents in here, so I just thought I wouldn't publish it. Um, on December 28th, 2022, Lee died unexpectedly. I was on my way back to Victoria, but my flights had been delayed for five days due to storms. He died on the day that I arrived. I gave a eulogy at his funeral. Beforehand, I googled eulogy. I did not want to focus on my own feelings of grief. I did not want to take up too much time. Ultimately, googling how to write a eulogy felt ridiculous. My anecdotes trite, the 10 minutes painfully short. Leading up to the funeral and in the days that have followed, I've often repeated this eulogy in my head, reordering the words time, uh, again and again, as if the right sequence might bring him back. Each time, I think about Kathy Colwitz, the artist Kathy Colwitz. In 1914, Colwitz's son, Peter, was killed in the war. Later, she wrote in a diary entry, made a drawing, the mother letting her dead son slide into her arms. I might make a hundred such drawings, and yet I do not get any closer to him. I am seeking him, as if to find him in the work, and yet everything I can do is so childishly feeble and inadequate. I feel obscurely that I could throw off this inadequacy uh, that Peter is somewhere in the work and I might find him. This is how I felt about Lee's eulogy. This is how I feel about this comic, that he is somewhere in the work, obscured only by my own feebleness and inadequacy. Um, this little dance I like to call the erotic crab. Careful or I'll pinch your jubblies. It's a real dance that Lee would do. Uh, Well-meaning friends say he lives on in you. This is meant to be a comfort. It is not. While we shared a lot, thought processes, art techniques, a sense of humor, what I loved most about Lee was his unknowability. His mind surprised me, his work astounded me, his comedy riveted me. That is all over now. Since his death, I've tattooed my own arm with Still Alive. It is a reminder of how, in some ways, I do carry him with me, a sentence of self-reassurance that I am still alive, a physical demarcation of the ever-growing chasm between us. But mostly, it's a joke for the mortician. All right, that's it. Um, so, thank you.
Uh, so, okay, so I thought that the way I would kind of go through this today, because I, I work in all these sort of disparate ways and on different projects, is kind of talk about some of the themes of my work, and then I'll get into some specific projects. So one theme that comes up, no matter how I'm working, is this idea of the cartoon. Um, which uh, I, my definition that I've written of the cartoon is a distillation of life into an eminently readable iconographic form. Um, so this might appear in things like this book, uh, Persepolis, by Marjan Setrapi, so things like graphic novels, which is a discipline that I've worked in. So Emily mentioned this book, Hot or Not, 20th Century Male Artists, or I've got another kind of science fiction graphic novel called XTC69, or my most recent book that came out last year called Rave, which is like an evangelical um, kind of coming of age story. Uh, so, so this is like kind of a very clearly within the cartoon universe. But I also think about things like emojis as functioning like cartoons, right? Like when you think about, I use emojis sometimes when I text and I think about this as this, it's a, a very direct, clear way of communicating ideas or sentiment um, that often is like much more direct than writing through text. Um, but I also think that this idea of the cartoon extends beyond uh, the modern world and that we can look back to things like this. This is the Sulawesi warty pig. This is the oldest conclusively dated cave painting in the world. It's from Indonesia. It's 45,000 years old. If we look at this image, um, if I like to imagine if I stepped or if we stepped into a time machine right now and went to Indonesia, um, and we're talking to the people who were in this cave, you wouldn't be able to speak the same language. All of our devices would be foreign to them. We couldn't communicate through writing. Um, but you could do a drawing of a pig and they would understand what you were talking about immediately. It's this like fundamental human form of communication. And I think that it's something that kind of, um, uh, I don't know, tran transcends media. It's like this, um, yeah, this, way of communicating. Um, so that I think is really important to me, both in the, the cartooning work, but also in the kind of textiles work, this way of communicating through images. Also humor, um, which I think of as fundamentally like the lens through which I engage the world, but also a way of, you know, form of resistance or a way of making certain traumas bearable. Um, and I just, uh, as sort of an example of some of the ways this manifests, sometimes in visual art, but also um, I, uh, before I made comics or zines, I was really into Facebook. I, I had a Facebook account and I would like to put jokes on Facebook uh, as my status update. So things like, okay, Cupid keeps changing my body to avuncular. Today I would put Tinder or something. Uh, some, some, something more contemporary. Or this, why these old things, these aren't shoes, they're simply spray shoes that I've sprayed onto my feet in a flip-flop configuration. Um, so, I don't know, like making status updates like this was really important to me and kind of like led into then making like writing work and zines and comics. Um, interdisciplinarity is kind of like the next thing that is like fundamental to my work. I find it really rewarding and generative to work across different media. So, uh, and I find that this is a way of kind of like reflecting experience. Um, this is the project Emily mentioned that was at the Kohler Art Center last year. So um, here's another installation of it. This was from, it was kind of a group show where each artist was given an area to, to make an installation. And for this, the prompt that we were given was a quote by Ruha Benjamin um, that was like, who's a kind of theorist philosopher. And her, the quote was, we must envision the worlds we cannot live without just as we dismantle those we cannot live within, something like that. And I was thinking about how tired I was all the time. Like I just, this was like, you know, this project came out in, about in maybe 2021. So it was sort of still COVID lockdown and just felt exhausted all the time. And so I was thinking this idea of like making a lazy boy um, I'll go back here for a second, came to mind because it just seems like the, the most like restful thing I could imagine, like relaxing in a lazy boy and making a space for people to do that in the gallery. Um, and then I was sort of 
thinking about uh, combining different interests of mine. So I was thinking about fourth style Roman wall painting, which is this kind of hodgepodge of different styles that uh, um, came before it. This is from Pompeii. But also I had moved in 2019 to Wisconsin, to Green Bay, Wisconsin. And one of the things that I noticed when I was looking for a place to live there is that a lot of houses had man caves in them, which felt like, I mean, I guess this is maybe everywhere, but it felt kind of like regionally specific and like this, it's like fundamentally hilarious to me that they're like, I don't know, these uh, people are like, oh, I need a space that's just for men because my, my wife is like, you know, cleaning and decorating the rest of the house. And there's just like something so silly to me about it, but also the idea of having a, you know, a room of one's own and space that you can kind of like occupy as you wish is like, feels important at the same time. Um, so this was my kind of version of a, of a man cave with this lazy boy that people coming into the gallery could recline in. Uh, and then kind of thinking about craft uh, traditions and these, these kind of like carpet pieces that I'll talk about in a minute too. Oh yeah, so here's another installation. Also looking at motifs from Roman fourth style wall painting. In Wisconsin, I was teaching Western art history. And so I got like really into, I don't know, the Roman empire uh, as is popular in TikTok these days, I've heard. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about those kinds of things. And then also just kind of like this rug in the middle here, which is like at the gallery, if you come to see it is sort of based off of some of the crochet work that my Swedish grandmother would do. And my grandmother died during COVID, didn't have a chance to go say goodbye to her as, as was the case for many of us who lost people in that time. So I was kind of thinking about her here and it's like in the place of a television, um, these guys. Um, so kind of this, this like jumping around in time a little bit, this brings me to another major component of my work, which is, uh, an interest in craft uh, or in textiles in particular, which I would define as historically devalued, often functional art forms. I also think in some ways cartooning can fall into the craft category or it's like there's a historically been a hierarchy between that and fine art. Um, so specifically after grad school, I started working with carpet and um, this is like a lot of the earlier work is collage. These are bath mats that I cut up and glued together because I came from a painting and drawing background. I didn't know what I was doing. I was kind of like inventing ways of working. But I liked how they seem to reference latch hook rugs uh, and these craft traditions. And um, since then, I've kind of expanded the ways I work as well. This is by another artist named Allison Mitchell, uh, an installation of, of latch hook rugs called Menstrual Hut. Um, and then I'll just kind of show a couple of like major projects. So I'd been working in this way with like textiles, with carpet, and I had this opportunity to do again a show that Emily mentioned uh, at the MCA in 2018, 2019. And I knew for this show I wanted to continue to use carpet. Um, but I also had been thinking about the, the 20th century design phenomena of carpeted walls. Um, so these amazing photographs are of the, the 60s bombshell Jane's Mansfield in her like incredible, disgusting carpeted bathroom, this pink shag rug everywhere. And it's like really intrigued by this and wanted to kind of incorporate some of this into the work. But I, oh yeah, and this is um, from the House on the Rock if you, in Wisconsin, which is like this mental place, fascinating place to go um, that's really Byzantine and, and kind of takes forever to get through. And there's also like some carpeted walls, um, which when I went there, I touched one of the carpeted walls and it was like soaking wet for some reason, which is also <laughs> just like totally viscerally disgusting. Um, so I'm kind of interested in these like intense visceral, dis you know, experiences related to home decor. Um, and also at this time, I was like, I'm an immigrant or, well, now I'm back in Canada, actually, but I had been in the States for a long time and I was going through immigration things and not able to leave, you know, for a couple of years and it was feeling quite homesick. And so that led me to think about where I'm from, where Lee and I are from, Victoria, British Columbia, and the one famous 
Canada famous artist from there, which is this woman, Emily Carr, with her amazing collection of animals, who was a painter, but she also, as I was doing research into her, discovered that she made rugs. Um, I don't know, I don't have, oh yeah, here's an image of her studio. So you can kind of see some of her paintings. They're largely of the forest and uh, the landscape in BC. Um, and you can see on the ground some of these rugs that she made. So she wasn't able to fully make a living as a painter and turn to rug making and other kinds of modes of, of income generation um, to survive. Uh, and that was really interesting, like discovering all these kind of points of intersection between our lives. And then the last thing I was really interested in was, um, you know, the history of cartooning and narrative art and how to incorporate this kind of comic side of my work into a gallery setting. And I started looking back to earlier narrative art traditions like um, Renaissance fresco painting, these amazing paintings by Giotto at the Scrivini Chapel in Italy. Um, which, okay, I don't have examples of, of this, but basically this is sort of like a comic book. It's like narrative stories from the life of Christ and uh, um, the Virgin Mary that are told in sequence um, through panels around the room. Um, so this seemed to me like a model that could be brought into to bring like narrative art back into the gallery space. And this manifested in this big installation here that has uh, scenes, kind of interspersed scenes from Emily Carr's life and scenes from my life. And they're, unlike the Giotto piece, they're kind of unreadable. Um, so they have that kind of iconographic cartoony feeling where you feel like you should understand what's happening in them but they're not, the narrative's a little bit disjointed. Um, and the room was very quiet because of all the carpet, which I also thought was really interesting. I'll go through these kind of quickly. Um, so they kind of alternate, I think it's, or it's, yeah, it's roughly alternate. So it's seen from my life and a scene from Emily Carr's life. And then they're kind of uh, um, some points of intersection between the two. Um, and each of the panels is like three by four feet, and then they were installed with carpet in between them, so it feels like one continuous piece that's like 72 feet long. Okay, there we go. Uh, and then the other kind of component of this exhibition was a room here that has a carpet on the wall and these, or on the floor, and then these drawings. And the carpet referenced in doing this research, uh, the exhibition was a part of the series called Chicago Works that's specifically about artists living and working in Chicago. And it felt important to me, or I, I just felt a little bit funny being like an immigrant making work about like my home country that had nothing to do with Chicago whatsoever. And so in doing research, I found out that Emily Carr did come to Chicago one time in uh, 19. 33, and she came specifically at the behest of Lauren Harris, Harris who is a painter, um, important Canadian painter, to come see this exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago. This is from the opening day of that exhibition. It was very popular. There were lots of uh, really important works in it, but she got her dates all muddled up and she arrived on the train the day after the show had closed. So she wasn't able to see any of it and she had a miserable time. She hated Chicago, she hated the trip. And in fact, it was the last big trip of her life. She had such a miserable time that she never really traveled again after that. And so the rug reproduces nudes that were in that exhibition that she wasn't able to see. She also had a very contentious relationship with the nude. As an art student, she wouldn't draw from nude models. She would leave the room and draw from sculptures. But it's also thought that she was probably a lesbian and definitely had like, um, you know, queer relationships. And so uh, she has this sort of interesting contentious history with uh, uh, nudity. And then on the wall, these drawings, the other kind of like fascinating thing that I discovered in researching Emily Carr is that she worked as a cartoonist. Um, so she worked briefly professionally as a cartoonist for a paper called the Western Women's Weekly uh, in 1918. But she also made these, what I find much more interesting, these diary comics that were really funny and often autobiographical and never published anywhere. So there's this whole series about these old women, spinster women who live together and then adopt this like disgusting cat that they're totally in love with and they let 
sleep on their beds and they're like, you know, sitting on uncomfortable wooden chairs while the cats lounged out on a couch. Um, she made a series also uh, when she was younger about her time studying art in London. And so the drawings here reproduced uh, these diary works by Emily Carr. And they're covered in charcoal in part because I wanted to make drawings that couldn't really be reproduced, that had to be seen in person. But I also felt like that gesture of having to go up to the drawings and look at them up close reproduced some of the intimacy of reading and reading journals um, and some of the phenomenon of like the way that women have been negated from the history of comics. Uh, and then the last component, I think so there's some of these floating around and maybe at the gallery was this free takeaway comic book um, that, yeah, so you should be able to pick one up if you want to, where each page corresponds with one of the panels in the gallery. And so in some ways it expands, uh, it explains the story of uh, um, the car chapel room, but in other ways it just kind of complicates things further. Um, the next kind of major project that I did was this installation, which um, I won't talk about at length, but it's a big kind of 30, I think it's like 32 feet long by, I don't know, 20 feet tall or something like that, um, or 16 feet tall installation at, at Facebook in San Francisco. Um, and I did this just in December of 2019. So it's like one big kind of narrative uh, scene of this figure walking through a garden. The angle means that you can't really get a proper photograph of it, but this is basically what it looks like. Um, it was produced in these chunks in my studio in Wisconsin and then shipped out there and installed. And one of the things that happened in making this work, and uh, so it's sort of like a in, basically like inlay where pieces of commercial carpet are cut and then collaged together. Um, what happened in making this work is that I produced a lot of scrap material and in making the exhibition for the MCA. So I had all these like random scraps sitting around. And then this is like December 2019. Uh, so I was like, okay, I'm set. I've done this big commission. I can kind of like work full time as an artist. And then the world shut down as we, as we all know. Uh, and so I found myself uh, all of a sudden with a lot of time in the studio, but then also feeling a lot of anxiety and stress and kind of felt like I had uh, an inability to produce work. And so I started gluing together scraps of material kind of at random uh, and then found as I was working, like I was doing that and then simultaneously having a lot of anxious thoughts about the world and the state of the world and also specifically... Um, uh, I, I sort of alluded to this, but I was raised in a really conservative evangelical household and my, um, I'm not like that anymore. Like my politics have veered away from that quite radically. So I have a lot of arguments in my head with my father. We don't have arguments face to face. We're like very, we just talk about dogs and the weather when we talk face to face, but I have a lot of arguments with him in my head. So I was having a lot of arguments with my dad and kind of like tripping out about things happening in the world and then gluing scraps of fabric together, carpet together. And I noticed that these figures started to emerge. Um, and then at the same time, again, teaching Western art history, uh, looking at the Greeks, I was, teaching about the gigantomachy, or the gigantomachy as a motif in Greek art, which is the battle between the gods and giants. Um, but it was often used as a kind of meta metaphor for what was happening in contemporary Greek society. So like uh, the Greeks fighting the Persians, for instance. And so I started to think about the gigantomachy as a metaphor for what I was experiencing or these kind of like fraught conditions that we were living under. Um, and so this, this show I, I called Giganto Machinations, uh, where it's kind of the Giganto Mackey and then also like the sort of ruminating that I was doing in my mind. I was also thinking about this phenomenon of pareidolia, which is like when you look at the clouds and you see like a face or you see like a bunny rabbit or something, which was, so there's like the sort of intuitive thing that was happening too. Um, and then all of the titles are, they correspond with either a god or a giant, and then, you know, these kinds of fears and um, fights that I was having in my head. So like Ares, fear of men, Apollo, fear of death, Mimas, fighting my dad about abortion, um, uh, Porphyrian, fighting my dad's belief that women are born to be servants, Hephaestus, fear my work doesn't matter, Helios, 
fear of the impending climate catastrophe, uh, Enceladus, fighting my dad about the existence of truth, Athena, fear of destitution, Alcyonius, fighting my dad about climate change. Um, so this, uh, yeah, this is sort of like what was happening at that time period. Uh, oh, yeah, and uh, feel tease fighting my dad about vaccines. My dad's like an anti-vaxxer. Um, I like this one. It sort of reminds me of, I don't know if you watch The Simpsons, but um, when Mr. Burns like uh, takes that medication that makes him look sort of like um, an alien. Uh, so that's sort of what this one thing makes me think of. Um, okay, and then this brings me kind of to the last major theme in my work that was definitely in that work uh, and then is present in the last project that I'm going to talk about, which is the personal. Um, and so I think like I am a person who thinks a lot through story and anecdote and who connects to people through hearing about their lives and through personal story. And it's, I mean, it's important to me to incorporate in that, my, that in my work. Beyond important, I think it's like the only way that, that I think or communicate. So it's like necessary. Um, and this is kind of part of what led me into, or you know, the combination of these different themes is what led me into the most recent big project that I com have completed, which is at the Fabric Workshop and Museum in Philadelphia. Um, so this project is built around a group called Heterodoxy, which is a feminist debate club started by this woman here sitting on the left. Her name was Jenny Marie Howe. She was a Unitarian minister and like activist. Um, and oh yeah, this is, this is the group that she started. This is a secret feminist debate club that was active in Greenwich Village from 1912 to 1940. Uh, and I became interested or aware of this group through reading this book by Jill Laporte, which is like super fascinating. If any of you are interested in the history of comics, this book, it's, um, it's about the guy who created Wonder Woman, who was like just this total insane maniac. Uh, he was like, he invented the lie detector test. He was like polyamorous and into BDSM and like uh, had really out there kind of like psychological ideas. Um, he was like, would do these like seances. He was very into spiritualism and like these all kinds of fascinating things. The book is fascinating. But one of the, the kind of portions of the book or the side notes in the book is a discussion of this person. This is a cartoonist named Lou Rogers, um, who is a suffrage cartoonist. Uh, in, largely made work about women's rights and reproductive rights. And um, so that was very interesting for me just to learn about her because one, the way that the history of comics is written is basically that there were no women making comics up until maybe the underground era in the 1960s. Um, so just finding out about her was like kind of novel. Uh, but beyond that, um, well, she's mentioned in the book specifically because her work was kind of used as the model for the original drawings for, of Wonder Woman. She was friends with William Moulton Marston, who created the character. And uh, when he was like looking for an artist, he was like, oh, I really want something that looks like Lou Rogers' work. But obviously, I would never hire a woman to draw this. So I'll just hire her coworker, Harry Peter, and get him to like rip off her work, which is what happened. Um, uh, but here's some examples. You can see some of those similarities here. Um, but one of the things that was also really fascinating to me about this was just, you know, because of the way that women are written out of the history of comics or when they are included, it's as if they're very much like an anomaly and that they sort of existed in a vacuum. Um, it was interesting to me to find out that not only was she making work at this time period, but that she was in a debate club with other women uh, and that their, their kind of like support of one another was crucial to all of their uh, success in their various fields. And there were some really, really prominent, the most famous member of the group was Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who wrote the Yellow Wallpaper, but there were lots of other people who were quite famous in their time in different disciplines. Um, uh, oh yeah, this, uh, this is also, I think, a really interesting book uh, by Joanna Russ, the science fiction writer, How to Suppress Women's Writing, that talks about um, the ways in which women writers' work have been dismissed historically, and one of the means by which they're dismissed is just by saying basically that you know, women writers are influenced by no previous women writers and had no subsequent influence. Um, and I think that's certainly true in comics too. And finding out about this group was like a refutation of that 
Um, the other thing that was really fascinating to me about this group is that it was secret. So there, were, there was a prohibition on recording anything that happened in the meetings, and this is because the members were quite well known in their fields, and if it had been known that they were hanging out with anarchists and uh, you know, what their actual personal beliefs were, that could inf impact their, you know, their professional standings. Um, there are some things that are known about it. So, for instance, this is like a poster for a uh, symposium kind of mass meeting that was organized about what, what is feminism um, by Marie Jenny Howe, the founder of the group. Um, they also, this is a, public, a little tract that she published called an anti-suffrage monologue, which is sort of like a satirical argument against suffrage. So they're definitely like using humor as a strategy. Also, the members were... There's also, there was one craftsperson who was a member of the group, this woman, Amy Molly Hicks. Um, and so her work and Lou Rogers' work, and there's one other art, visual artist in the group kind of helped me to think about what form uh, an exhibition about these people could take. This is Amy Molly Hicks. Um, and so I sort of looking at this one photograph of her in her studio with these rugs that she made, uh, I, I made some, some riffs on uh, the designs and I found on a, a latch hooking forum online an image of a rug that she'd produced and pulled colors from there. And then this museum, the fabric workshop is like a really, if you ever have a chance to go to Philadelphia, it's a really unique and fascinating institution. They work collaboratively with artists. I was in residence there for like a year and a half, but remotely, so they ended up producing a lot of the work. They got a yarn company to dye, custom dye this yarn, and we had like 500 pounds of yarn that went into making the walls that you'll see momentarily. Um, so I kind of knew I wanted to, oh yeah, this is a sneak preview of what it looked like. So I knew I wanted to incorporate these kind of craft motifs as uh, the material culture kind of like visual component of this group, a way of making the secret group feel manifest. And then the other thing was like, you know, what, how do you make visual uh, or what kind of space should this be? This is an image of Polly's restaurant, which is, was an anarchist cafe in Greenwich Village. This was the first meeting house or the first place that this group would meet. They met there for the first couple years of their existence. At a certain point, they started to be followed by um, some government agency. It's not totally clear. And so they had to uh, rotate to where they would meet every week and they stopped meeting here but this was their their first place they would go to and so that kind of uh, the idea came b to um, uh, recreate like a kind of reimagined version of this meeting house that they would go to but I also wanted to reflect back the the secrecy of their meetings and so the strategy that I came up with was having these tufted walls with mirrors, two-way mirrors embedded in them and the lighting in the gallery changes. So sometimes the objects embedded within the walls are visible and in the tables and sometimes they aren't. This is like an early mock-up of what that might look like. And then this is, I'm gonna show a video that kind of like gives a walkthrough of the exhibition so you can actually see what it looks like. Um, and then there are tables, I'll show some photos in a minute, tables with artifacts related to the group embedded within them. Again, two-way mirrors, so like sometimes visible and sometimes not. These are portraits of the members of the group embedded in the walls. sort of thinking about I'm really into like small town history museums and historical societies and so some of the display strategies are, are kind of riffing off of that.
These are scalloped rugs that were um, made from the designs in the Amy Molly Hicks book, The Craft of Handmade Rugs. Um, so the other kind of component of this exhibition is it's replicating the space that they met in, but it's also like a functional meeting space. And so there's going to be um, a like symposium series of talks related to, you know, they, uh, the group from what little records we, we have would have speakers come and talk to them about relevant issues of their time. So for instance, Margaret Sanger. Came, we know that Margaret Sanger came to talk to them, who's the founder of what is now Planned Parenthood. Um, and we know that because she was very disappointed in the group. She was like kind of single-mindedly interested in reproductive rights and uh, um, access to birth control. And the members of the group were interested in those things, but also at that time they were very interested in um, a, a woman's right to keep her maiden name when she got married, which Sanger thought was like totally frivolous and ridiculous and kind of like a waste of her time to talk about. And so she like wrote kind of admonishingly about that. And similarly, the poet Amy Lowell came to talk to them and she was really frustrated because some of the members wanted her to read love poetry and she felt like that was like kind of beneath her and too frivolous. So we know about some of those things and there were certainly topics that they were interested in like prison reform and voting rights and um, uh, I don't know, child um, welfare um, that are relevant um, and reproductive rights that are like definitely still relevant today. And so there's gonna be a series of talks in um, January that bring to people together to kind of talk about some of these themes. And I think what, what one of the things that really excites me about this group was this idea of interdisciplinarity and people from different fields coming together and different political backgrounds. The only rule of the group was that members m not have any orthodoxy. They had to be kind of unorthodox or heterodox in their thinking. Uh, and that idea of like bringing to people together who might have sort of diverging opinions or backgrounds um, or points of entry to topics to talk together is really exciting to me and also feels kind of like an antidote to some of what uh, at least I experience being online where it's just like this sort of intractable, uh, you know, um, uh, hatred or something for anyone who doesn't exactly have, you know, your your same perspective or isn't communicating uh, correctly or, or clearly what they think. Um, the other thing about this group is that they, they kind of used the personal as a point of entry. So members were inducted into the group by sharing a test childhood testimonial about how they were raised. And I think that this was used as a way of breaking down barriers in between them and kind of forcing them to see one another's humanity, which is also something I, I think we could always use more of. Um, so there are lots of things that I think are really fascinating. These are images of some of the artifacts that are housed within the group. This is or within the exhibition. 
Um, this is a, a booklet here called Marriage Customs and Taboo Among the Heterodites, which was like a, a faux sociological tract by one of the members. Um, and some of these objects are actual artifacts and some of them are replicas. And I haven't made that super clear in the exhibition because I'm also interested in playing around with didactics and like truth um, and, and like the, the authority of the institutional voice. Um, and asking people to question that because it's not always um, completely true. Uh, some more images. These are some anti-suffrage cartoons, um, which I think are kind of like funny and horrifying. And the different ways that cartooning is instrumentalized is really interesting to me. Um, so this is the most recent project that's just opened in about a month ago. It was October 6th that it opened. It'll be up until the end of March and kind of activated through talks during that time. And that's the, that's the last slide that I have here. I realize I like run through a lot of different things uh, in the course of this talk, but I'd be very happy to answer questions and or like go into anything in more detail. And thank you all so much. This is in Philadelphia. It's at a place called the Fabric Workshop and Museum. Yeah, so it's not too close, sadly. <laughs> Yeah, I'm interested in sculpture. I mean, I think it's, when I've tried to do it, I'm like, oh, this is way more difficult uh, just to like change your thinking from two dimensional to three dimensional. So I guess like I would think of like the lazy boy that I reupholstered with the car wash mat material as kind of sculptural. And then obviously here there's a sort of furniture, three dimensional component. So these tables were, well, I designed, I didn't actually make them. This guy, Alan, who I've been working with at the museum made them. Um, but so those are sort of sculptural. There's like these cushions that are in the chairs that are they're kind of sculptural. But I, I mean, I love sculpture. With I'm like interested in everything, basically. I'm like, oh, I want to make videos and sound pieces and sculpture for sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that one was like one of when I was going crazy during COVID, like gluing scraps together because I didn't know, couldn't focus uh, in the studio. Um, that's that one came out of that kind of moment for sure. Yeah. So when thinking about this piece, mm -hmm. the, the different sort of portraits mm -hmm. uh, and like all of the secrecy. So how much of the portraits are sort of invented or were there certain things that you could hold on to in order to invent the portrait? Yeah. Yeah, and um, so there's like a pretty comprehensive record of a, a lot of the members, like 120 of the members, and there is a book that they produced, uh, a scrapbook for the founder called um, From Heterodoxy to Marie that has all of their photographs or m many of the members' photographs and like text in them. But for what I did, um, like I also just have these ways of working where sometimes it's like kind of stuffy and planned out and everything's kind of like scripted out in advance in that I think is good in some ways. Sometimes curators really like it because it like makes it easier to write about the work and talk about it. Um, but it can deaden the work sometimes for me in the studio if everything's too rigidly planned out. So a lot of these, these are made, it's hard to tell from this image, but these are um, gouache. I painted on gouache and then collage them together. And then it's kind of like a paper version of what I was doing in carpet where they're, they're sort of more like imagined or the figures are like pulled out of those collages. I was also looking at like, in, I really love Matisse uh, um, as maybe everyone does, um, but he has those great like paper collage pieces that he made near the end of his life where you'd paint on paper and then cut out shapes with scissors. So he's definitely like looking at that and thinking about those. Um, so they're mostly like more invented, but I do think about them as specific members. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you still teach at UCLA? 
Yeah, I just moved. I moved to Toronto because I got a teaching job at a university called York. Um, so I'm teaching drawing right now. We're just doing figure drawing at the moment, which is great. It's so fun. Do you miss the influence of the art history of classes you have seen on mm. I like, I love art history and I love reading about it and I did enjoy teaching it, but I'm not an art historian. I was just like, lived in this town where like, they were like, oh, you have an MFA? No one else here has that degree. Can you come teach these classes? And I was like, yeah, okay. Uh, so it was sort of like a lot of work for me and people have PhDs in that and really like um, know their stuff in a way that I don't. Um, so I enjoyed it, but I, I find studio is a lot more fun for me to teach. And then I can just read and enjoy, read about and enjoy art history on my own time without having to teach it, without having to Wikipedia ancient Egypt at like midnight before I go to class the next morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I no, I sort of made the pieces and then I was like thinking, I mean, there were certain things I was just sort of ruminating on where I'm like, I'm thinking a lot about COVID and vaccines and I'm thinking a lot about climate change and I'm thinking a lot about, you know, my my dissipating savings account and, and whatever and destitution. And so there were these things I was like worried about and fights I was having with my dad. And then I sort of just went and looked at the Gigantomachy and tried and sort of like looked at the pieces and was like okay what does this one remind me of um so definitely the titles came and usually for me titling comes like at the end um uh, of the work that I do um yeah yeah what are you looking forward to next hmm what am I looking forward to uh well the next kind of project where i have an idea of what i'm like working on some stuff in the studio where i'm just sort of screwing around at the moment and i'm doing a book for i'm supposed to do a book and organize this symposium for the fabric workshop so i need to work on that um, but i'm supposed to do this residency at spaces in cleveland in the spring and what i proposed during covid when i was like trapped in green bay with no friends I had, uh, I had a friend, my, one of my best friends is in San Francisco, and I would talk to her about like trying to meet up in our dreams. <laughs> and I'd be like, okay, let's try to meet up in our dreams tonight. And we would like pick somewhere where we would try to meet, like the Eiffel Tower or whatever, and uh, it never worked. It, it never worked at all. But I liked that idea a lot, and then I, I sort of, I proposed that when I go to Cleveland, I will make art that only exists in people's dreams. Um, and I, like, I'm kind of interested in, like, reading about, like, dream theory, but also, like, you know, I'm sure that all of us have had this experience where, like, things from your life kind of filter into your dreams, uh, and I'm curious about if I can manipulate that, like, if I fall asleep staring at a picture of a gorilla, will I have a dream about a gorilla at night? I'm also really interested in making art that's, like, completely immaterial and cannot be, um, monetized at all it, like it exists outside of the art market which uh, and is accessible to everyone theoretically because we we all sleep hopefully um so that's kind of like this project this insane project where i was like surprised that they agreed to let me do it um but i'm excited about that and like part of me wants to set up like a sleep clinic or something and think about like how i might influence my or other people's dreams um so, and I, I've got like a Freud's interpretation of dreams sitting on my desk at home, but I haven't read it yet. But <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit excited about that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you.